All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the League Express podcast. My name's Jake Keenan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. Martin, how's your week been? Oh, it's been pretty good, and, um, you know, it's good to see you back again, Jake, and I believe you've had a once-in-a-lifetime experience very recently. Yes, in yes. In Manchester. What did you see? Uh, yesterday, I uh, saw... Uh, my first, or had my first experience in the snow, which was uh, a bit, <laughs> bit of a life-changing experience. I think the last time it snowed was in December, but I believe it was at night time, so I didn't get out and, and yeah. enjoy it. But and you've yeah. never seen snow in Queensland, no. you lucky devil. <laughs> no, 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 never seen snow in Queensland. So uh, yeah, yeah, my partner and I got out and, and made the most of it. Only snowed until about eleven a.m. I think, but yeah. made a few snowballs and, and threw them at my partner, which she uh, didn't enjoy too much. <laughs> I was going to say, be careful who you throw them at. Yeah, no, yeah that's in right. Manchester especially. No, but I tell you what, though, one thing that sort of uh, caught me by surprise is how slippery it gets. Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, it snows. does. So you've got to be very careful, and yeah, you're easy to break a leg, mate. Oh, so absolutely, take care. And some of the rivers that are sort of frozen over, I've never seen a, a frozen river or a lake. So, no, 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 uh, no. I won't be getting my ice skates out though. No, that way. don't. <laughs> uh, I'll end up with a broken arm. But and um, you'll, you'll fall through the ice as well. That's yeah, the other thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Couldn't okay. think of anything worse. Um, <laughs> Now, we've had, uh, unfortunately, some, some tragic news that's happened uh, over the past couple of days, Martin. Um, unfortunately, the, the rugby league community has lost um, you know, one of the, the former Salford captain, uh, Malcolm Alka, uh, who tragically passed away at the age of 45. Uh, what was your reaction to this news? Well, the club announced his death on Sunday, and obviously it was a shock, because I can't say that I knew Malcolm uh, well. Uh, obviously, I'd, I'd spoken to him a few times when he was a player and, and, and the Salford captain, and he always seemed a really great kid to me. And um, obviously, he struggled uh, when he retired. And he, he actually wrote a book, an autobiography. I mean, he retired in 2010. I think injuries had finally caught up with him. Um, but then he wrote his autobiography, which was published in 2012. And in that, he admitted to having taken drugs during his playing career, including cocaine <coughs> and uh, growth hormones. And, the, the, you know, you, you've got to say that, as I think I said when I was writing about him in this week's League Express, you know, that's admirably honest to do that. But the trouble with, with you know, a biography that reveals warts and all, so to speak, is that it guaranteed he would probably never work in rugby league again um so that was unfortunate because rugby league had been his life i mean he was a, a, a rugby league kid through and through he originally from wigan came through wigan st patrick's the um well-known community club in wigan um he, he 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 was an incredibly dedicated player um i think it was um in 2001 he became the first player to make over a thousand tackles in a super league season um he always um, led from the front um, as in, in, in that regard, particularly defensively. Um, and he, he, he did play for England on, on, on one occasion, although there were a lot of other good hookers obviously he had to contend with for, for an international spot. So uh, it is a tragedy, and my real deep respect and condolences go out to his family. Um, obviously, you know, he suffered a decline uh, personally and suffered quite a a lot of mental health issues um, after, well, actually during his playing career as well, as well as after it. And, um, you know, I think I quoted um, something that John Wilkins said in a, in a podcast last year about Malcolm, saying that, you know, he was an early advocate of um, mentoring for, mental, for players' mental health, but he didn't get a response back in about 2000 and, uh, you know, the early 2000s. Um, and... He was always one of these guys who came back very quickly from injury and was always prepared to carry injuries in order to be able to play. And you have to ask sometimes whether players need to be protected from themselves, in my view. Mm. You know, it was, uh, it, it was so sad. It's so easy to be wise in hindsight, of course, but it was so, the news was so desperately sad. And you wonder what could have been done, if anything, to avoid that you know, tragic situation occurring. Um, and the, the only good thing we can say is that there is much more emphasis now on, on players' uh, health, both physical and mental. And if Malcolm had been playing today, perhaps 
you know, his life wouldn't have ended in that sort of very tragic way. Mm, absolutely. And do you think it might come as maybe a bit of a wake-up call that we do need to be doing more to support players that are retiring? And Oh, I think so, yes. On? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult transition, isn't it, for a player? Mm. Uh, I mean, it's an unusual career. You know, most of us retire when we're in our 60s, I suppose. Um, or, you know, I've not retired yet. But um, when you're a player, you've got to retire in your 30s, uh, sometimes even earlier than that if injury forces you to retire. And and then you've suddenly got to make a massive transition in your life. Mm. And some people who have had n nothing else but rugby league, and the same is true of any sport. It's not just rugby league, is it? Yep. The same, you know, you've, you've, you've got a you know, famous sportsman like Andy Murray facing potential retirement from tennis at the moment. And, you know, everybody has to adjust to life as no longer a top sportsman and it's not easy it's a transition that's very hard for some people to make and you know some people do need help and do need a bit of guidance um in terms of what direction they're going to go in in future Absolutely. so but you know all that of course is too late for for malcolm and uh, as i say I'm, I'm just desperately sad for for him and all his family and friends and you know i just hope that they can get through this and um and I hope that Malcolm in particular now is able to rest in peace. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, our condolences go out to his family and all those affected by his uh, tragic passing. Um, yeah, not, not the way we want to sort of end our weekend, that's for sure. But um, yeah, yeah, rest in peace to uh, Malcolm Malcolm. And yeah, it's uh, a bit of a tough way to start the podcast. Yes, um, it is. It yeah, is. Yeah, we've... Um, but yeah, we have had some uh, other news around the rugby league community. The NRL has just announced some real changes this morning, Martin. That's sort of caught our attention. Yes. Um, it's all around the short dropouts, short kickoffs. Uh, mm. So our understanding is that now instead of a, a failed short dropout or short kickoff attempt um, that doesn't go 10 metres or goes out on the full, uh, instead of the receiving team being awarded a penalty, they'll be given, uh, or they'll have to play the ball. 10 metres in from the sideline and also 10 metres from the line that the ball yes. was kicked. Yes. So presumably we we assume that for a kickoff attempt that goes out in the full, we believe that that means that there will now be a play the ball 10 metres in on the 40 metre line. Yes. Um, now, I guess, what's your initial reaction to this rule change? Do you like it? Well, uh, only having heard about it this morning... Um, it, You'd have to study it hard and, and think of all the, you know, potential consequences because sometimes when you make rule changes, there are unintended consequences. And you've always got coaches who are prepared to try to exploit any rule changes to their own benefit. I mean, on the face of it, it looks a very good change because uh, it, it will uh, obviously encourage... I mean, what, what, what the NRL wants to encourage is, is, is more of a... a a contest for the ball and a, a short dropout or a short kickoff uh, certainly does do that doesn't it so mm. but of course the risk has always been that if it doesn't go the full 10 meters you end up conceding a penalty and that's a very big deterrent mm. so that deterrent has now been removed so on the face of it we should be seeing a lot more short kickoffs and dropouts and one guy who i've got no doubt would probably like to see it brought into the british game is leeds coach rowan smith who mm -hmm. whose side you know pursued that tactic a lot last year mm -hmm. not always successfully and and they did give away a few penalties when when dropouts didn't go the full 10 meters but uh, you know i'm 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 fairly sure that rowan um, I can't speak for him, of course, and, and he might contradict me, but I would have thought that he might be one individual coach over here pressing for us to adopt that rule as well. So um, we haven't done at the moment. We, we've, we, we very often do follow Australian rule changes in, in Super League and so on, but um, there's been no indication yet, but um, I'm sure we'll be making those inquiries to see whether we do 
decide to go down that route or not. Mm. It's definitely going to make uh, the end of games exciting because you tend to see that tactic brought in uh, a lot more when you know you're short on time and you, you're yes. behind by a few points. And um, yes, I know there's a few uh, important finals games that were sort of decided by penalty goals from in front of the sticks. So, yes, um, I'm excited for the real change. And uh, as you said, well, it's I'm- certainly going to be interesting to see how it works, isn't it? And um, you know, and and to see whether. You know anybody backtracks on it to see whether any coaches. I mean, I, I, I don't know that there's been no indication of whether this has come from coaches in Australia, but I suspect they might have had quite a bit to do with it. Mm. Um, but whether any of them, when they see it in practice, will sort of change their mind or not, who knows? Will yeah. it's going to be interesting to see. And it's always. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we sometimes say that. We don't want endless rule changes every year because, it, you know, fiddling about with, with the rules, let's just enjoy the game and, uh, as it is. But nonetheless, when rules are changed, it is a talking point, Jake, isn't it? Mm. It does, and it does make us sort of look at the games and, and see how they're going to work out. So I'm sure that will be particularly interesting. Mm. And um, we'll see a lot of those games because we're going to see, I think, virtually all the um, pre-season challenge games on, on Sky over here. Yep. So we'll be able to get the chance to see how it works, won't we? Absolutely. And it's a good point you touched on there because the amount of comments I've read over the years where fans will um, make you know, social media comments that they've you know stopped watching the game because of all the rule changes and mm. they just want the game left alone. I guess that's probably more the traditionalist view. But yeah. I think rules like this that can uh, potentially improve the game uh, you know, need, need, need to be made, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there are some rules that um, the Aussies have brought into the NRL that we haven't followed over here. And the one that sticks out for me is the two-point field goal, you know, where you kick a field goal from, you know, beyond the 40-meter line and, and get two points for it. I, I, I don't know. I think there were only about three of those in the NRL last year, if I remember rightly. Mm. Uh, you know, contradict me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think that's a really great rule. And I, I, I really regret that we didn't bring it in because, you know, it. it I, I, I like rules that, um, you know, reward skill, you know. And, and obviously, if you can kick a field goal from 40 metres and get two points for it that's that's a great skill that you're you know mm. uh putting into practice and y- you know i think it's great to see you being rewarded with with an, an additional point compared to a normal field goal so uh, you know we didn't we didn't follow the nrl in, the, in in that regard and i really think that we should have done and um you know it'd be interesting i'm, I'm sure you and i as well could sit here and think through quite a lot of rule changes that we could suggest that we th- might think would also improve the game. Mm. And, you know, it's certainly something that I occasionally do in my spare moments, just sort of, because I think about rugby league a lot and, yeah. um, you know, how to make it even more exciting than, in my view, it is already. Mm. And speaking of exciting, uh, Jay Field, he's re-signed Absolutely. Uh, with the Wigan Warriors for a further four years. Uh now, the Wigan chief, Chris uh, Radlinski, has come out and said that fans need to enjoy his talent because, uh, you know, talent like this doesn't come around Enjoy often. him while he's there, mm. yes. And it, it's the same with any player who's got built-in excitement. And, and they've also signed Abbas Miski, Abbas by the Miski, way, to, yeah. to a four-year deal as well. So that's great business by Wigan. And, um, and I think he's right. You know, a, a enjoy watching really, you know, players who can, you know, do the... Do what others can't, I suppose, is what you might say. And speed is such a vital factor in rugby league, isn't it? Mm. And Jay Field has it, and so does Abbas Miski. And, you know, I mean, Abbas Miski, in, in a way, is an even better story because, you know, Wigan signed him from London Broncos. And when they first signed him, he wasn't getting in the side, mm. but he finally got a break and has never looked back and scored bucketfuls of tries as well mm. so yeah, marvellous uh, marvellous for him and uh, it's great to see and, and while we're talking about Wigan incidentally we do have a, you know Steve Nibbets and our reporter for League Express has done a very full um, pre-season well a full season preview in League Express this week and uh, it's fascinating to read and we've picked out a few things player to watch um 
who we've picked out, Brad O'Neill, the, the, the young hooker who's got the number nine shirt this year. He's, he's, I think he's a potentially really fine player. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him, uh, if there is a test series at the end of this year. We don't know if there will be yet, but if there is, I wouldn't be surprised to see him knocking on the door. We've got a uh, player under pressure, Mike Cooper. Um, who's who's been a had a great career, but suffered a dreadful ACL injury last year. Coming back with a lot of competition for prop forward spots. Yeah. Key newcomer um, is Luke Thompson. Um, you know who's coming back after several years in the NRL, which started out really well, but then he got bogged down by a few injuries, and his his career didn't progress perhaps as he hoped with the Bulldogs in the NRL, and he's coming back to play for Wigan now, of course, um, as a former St. Helens player. He won the um, Harry Sunderland Trophy as the player of the match in the 2019 Grand Final when St. Helens beat Salford, so... He's going to be a really interesting signing for Wigan, I think, mm. this year. So uh, it's it's going to be fascinating stuff, isn't it? No, absolutely. And uh, Luke Thompson, like, even with all the injuries he sustained at the NRL, I still feel like he was able to um, so sort of, oh, how would you say, establish his reputation. Like, oh, yes. People know he's a tough player and he's a, a really, really good player. But And I think we're all aware of the injuries that it sort of derailed his stint in the NRL. Mm. But... Yeah, as we touched on last week, I think it'd be interesting to see if he has a full year, a healthy year, will he attract interest from the NRL again? Well, I'm sure he probably would do. And the thing was that um, he was actually quoted sometime last year. You know, there was... I, I, think, I don't think the Bulldogs offered him a new contract, but I, I, you know, I may be wrong. But, you know, he did say at the time that he'd like to stay in the NRL because I think he's grown used to living in Australia and enjoys it, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, Wigan made him an offer that was too good to refuse um but you know he, he, he will um i mean he's 28 now so he's still got time on his side um and i think he probably would go back to the nrl if if given the chance and a decent contract mm. so it's a big year for him to play really well yeah. and what a great start it would be if he could lead wigan the wigan pack to victory in the World Club Challenge against Penrith Panthers. Mm, absolutely. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Jay Field and Bevan French will be licking their lips at being able to, you know, support him, uh, looking for the offload through absolutely, the middle of the field. Because, yes. you know, they're the best at playing with broken play, I feel yeah, like, yeah. Wigan. And the amount of long field tries, long distance tries we've seen from Jay Field, Bevan French, Harry Well, Smith, that's, what the, just... that's what the fans love to see, isn't it? Mm. That's what the fans love to see. By the way, in, in that regard, we were talking just now about rule changes. Now, I proposed one... Um, a few years ago that you might be interested. I Obviously, a, a, a try you get four points for, but I proposed that if you score a try from a play the ball that took place in your own half, in other words, a long-distance try, mm. why not give five points for that? Yeah. You know, to, to reward you know, the sort of try that we all love to see. Mm. Uh, one or two people shouted me down on that and said we shouldn't <laughs> distinguish between different sorts of try. And I can understand that argument, of course. Yeah. But to um, but to see a, you know, a real long-distance try of the sort that Jay Field, you know, is perfectly capable of scoring, or Bevan French or, or even Liam Marshall at, uh, at Wigan, all great players, mm. um, I, I think five points for a try like that would be you know, a good reward. What, what do you think? Am I, yeah. am I being nuts or what? No, well, we've seen the uh, five-point try trialled with the um, the old nines tournaments. They yes. had the bonus zone under the post there, and yeah, I think that... Um, yeah, that's a, a different thing, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I, I wasn't quite so sure, keen on that. Yeah, but, I mean, just as an example, like, that sort of was critical in some of the results we'd see yes. in those nines tournaments that we play our team scoring less tries, but because they scored those five-point tries, mm. uh, you know, you saw the, the, the victory go their way. So, yeah, an interesting uh, point that I'm sure a lot of people will argue for and against. Oh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, but that's the whole point of debate, isn't it? Mm. Some, some are for and some are against. But, mm. you know, I, I think um, uh, rugby league is an incredibly flexible game in terms of the, the laws of the game, the rules of the game. Um, they can be tweaked um, in very interesting ways, I think. And, um, you know, that's, that's just one example. Um, compared to you know what we've seen the NRL doing doing today, but um, you know we'll see. And 
Who knows what the game may look like in another 10 years? Yeah, who knows? There might be robots playing, maybe. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll see. Um, now, in other signing news, uh, Wunga Blake has officially signed with uh, the Saints. Now, there's been a few rumours about this happening over the past couple of weeks. But yes. But he joins them from uh, the Parramatta And gets a number three shirt vacated by Will Hopoati. Mm, so, yeah. not a bad replacement for the Saints. I expect uh, he'll be able to fill the shoes of... Well, Saints will have done their homework on on, on Wanga Blake, and um, they'll know what exactly what they're getting. And obviously, they've been looking for quite some time for somebody to replace Will at number three, mm. and they've now got their man. And um, we'll see how he performs. But obviously, he's he's, he's, he's had a great career so far, and um, you know, good luck to him. He's uh, he's one of the players we've listed. We, we've we've actually got a, a a League Express readers poll this week as we have every week, of course. Yep. And is basically, this week's poll is, um, which player coming to Super League from the NRL uh, will have the biggest impact in 2024? Mm. And we've got eight players named, actually. Wanga Blake of St. Helens, Herman S.E.S.A. of Hull FC, Lachlan Fitzgibbon of Warrington, Peter Hiku of Hull KR, Paul Momirovsky of Leeds Rhinos, Matt Moylan of Lee Leopards, Tarek Sims of Catalan's Dragons and Luke Thompson of Wigan Warriors. So there's mm. quite a quite a choice there of players, and uh, it just sort of shows how many players we get from from the NRL. It's quite uh, incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. Unfortunately, you know, you're not able to, to list all of them. Um, no. But if you had to have your early pick, is there any players there that sort of catch your eye? That well, I think I I, I would go for Luke Thompson, N- not not because he's an Englishman, but because <laughs> you know he he. If, if he can recapture the form that he had for St. Helens in 2019, then I, I think he could be a hell of a signing for Wigan. And uh, as I say, Wigan are the club that you know has the chance of making an immediate impact this season with the World Club Challenge. So um, I, I think Luke is is you know hopefully fit and well and raring to go. And if he is. He's going to have a really interesting battle against those Penrith forwards, isn't he? Mm, absolutely. And, you know, we talk about it quite often, but it's not just what he brings on the field, it's what he brings off the field. And mm. that leadership and being able to mentor some of the young guns coming through. Absolutely. I think that, you know, is sort of uh, an undervalued skill when it comes to these contracts. And, mm. yeah, he's. He's still, um, you know, not he's getting on in age, but he's still got plenty of football left in him. Oh yes, so, yes. Um, you know, who knows? He might he might finish his career at Wigan if he. Well, has you never know. Campaign. Yes, yeah. Um, and you good know, for him. What a side to do it with at the moment. By the way, talking about Wigan and Penrith, have you, have you seen that uh, Penrith will, will be using Manchester City's facilities? Oh, really? For for preparing for the World Club Challenge? Yes, they've. They've um, developed a relationship with Manchester City, yeah. and they're going to be... I mean, Manchester City have got an absolutely brilliant training base in East Manchester, all around the um, stadium, the um, Etihad Stadium, yeah. and Penrith will be moving in there to, uh, to prepare for the, um, for the World Club Challenge, and they'll also be playing a, um, a contact game against Warrington Wolves in preparation for that game. So they're taking it deadly seriously obviously mm. well as we knew they would do um it's going to be quite a a challenge for wigan and challenge for penrith it's going to be a game really worth seeing isn't oh, it that absolutely. game and is that's what saints did when they came to australia did they play a, a warm-up game against they, they played st. against george? st george yes yeah. in in the pre-season challenge that the um <coughs> nrl put on and um and beat st george if you remember um jake yeah. and they they prepared uh, their first week at Narrabeen, which is Manly's training facility in, in Australia, which is a, a beautiful facility. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, East Manchester can't quite compare with that in terms of environment, but certainly in terms of facilities, uh, it's got absolutely everything that you could possibly want, I think. Mm, no, absolutely. And I'm sure they'll be hoping some of uh, Man City's recent success over the past 12 months will rub off on them. Well, the interesting thing is that Manchester City have won the... Premier League three times in a row Mm -hmm. and Penrith have won the NRL three times in a row Mm. so there's a connection there isn't there yeah yeah. and it's fascinating to see you know how that uh, you know how that's developed and uh, 
you know, I, I think does does Nathan Cleary's girlfriend Mary Fowler does she play for Manchester City or is it Manchester United? I'm not quite so sure. I think maybe Man City, but yeah, yeah, she's definitely you know one of one of the uh, the better players coming yes. out of our country. That's oh, there's sure. no doubt about it. And, yeah, uh, we've touched on the power couple status yes. that they've been awarded. Yeah. Um, so actually, I believe Nathan Cleary uploaded a photo of those two together on his social media that, the other day. So Did that's, he? Um, you know, as the, the the younger generation say, that makes it official if it's on uh, Facebook or Instagram. So <laughs> good, um, good. Yeah, but yeah. it's going to be a great night. At, I mean, it's heading for a sellout, isn't it? I think we're going to have sold probably twenty two, twenty three thousand tickets. It's now mm. it's round about a twenty five thousand capacity. Mm. It's it's going to be jam packed, and that's just a tremendous thing. And I mean, it's interesting. Last year at Penrith, the crowd was just thirteen thousand and odd. Yeah. The, the the Australian fans didn't take it that seriously, right. which is disappointing because that's that's the, that was the lowest ever crowd for a World Club Challenge game. Mm. I think and, you know, and we, I, I've got to say that. Historically, in this country, we've taken the World Club Challenge more seriously than the Australian clubs, mm. by and large. You know, that's a very broad generalisation. Mm. Not true in every case. But I think, the, I, I, think the, I think Penrith had such a shock to their system last year that they are taking it... I mean, they denied that they didn't take it seriously, of course. They mm. denied that they were complacent. But it's very hard to think that they weren't. And... They're certainly not going to be this year. There will be absolutely no excuses this year whatsoever for them, will there? No, absolutely right. And that's the unfortunate thing, I think, with a lot of Australian clubs is they do sometimes look at it as if it's a pre-season fixture. Oh, I know. And, and it's, there's a lot on the line, like your reputation, yeah. the, you know, the whole sport in your countries uh, on the line. Well, what I would like to see, uh, <laughs> again, coming back to how we might make rugby league better, what I would really like to see, Jake, is the two grand finals – Super League and the NRL played on the same weekend. And then maybe two weeks later, um, a World Club Challenge game, you know, played soon after, you know, two weeks after the respective grand finals, mm. ideally at a neutral location, which mm. might be, you know, who knows where that might be, but could be Las Vegas or could be, you know, somewhere halfway between australia and um and and england mm. um so that it didn't seem like a pre-season event yeah. it was actually a post-season you know well a, a climax to the season for the for the winners of the grand finals from both both competitions and and that would make it so much more compelling in my view for the wider public you know the problem with this game is that Everybody in Wigan and in Rugby League is excited about it, and obviously Penrith are excited about it. But the wider public have probably forgotten now, you know, people who are not particularly interested in Rugby League will have forgotten who won Super League and who won the NRL. Mm. And, you know, it will, it'll seem a, a bit odd playing this game so long after those two games were played. So mm. that would be my solution. No, absolutely. And the other issue with playing it the following year is it's not the same team. You know, you're losing and players. And sometimes not bringing, the same coach. That's right. You're losing players, bringing players in and you know what it's like when, it, when a team wins a grand final, everybody's uh, value yes. uh, contract-wise goes up so they attract interest from other clubs and you know, sometimes there might be that off-season where players are going into the open market. Um, I, I agree with your suggestion. It'd be great to see a week or two later. Yeah, yeah. Still got the same coach, same squad. Um, especially for players that are planning on retiring at the end of the year. Absolutely. You know, it gives them a chance to, for another match uh, yes. before they head off into retirement. Well, so. I can't see why it should be so difficult. I mean, obviously, we also play International Rugby League at the end of the season, but again, I would switch that to playing in July, you know, mm. a, 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 a better month of the year to play International Rugby. And there's so much you could do if you... You know, if you could be a benevolent dictator for rugby league, there's a lot you could do, I think, to make it more attractive and to align the competitions. And, you know, there's all sorts you could achieve, in in my view. No, oh, absolutely. And uh, as we always bring it back to, you and I are both huge advocates of shortening the season. Oh, yes. Um, I think if we just shorten the season, there'd be so many issues it gives you It gives you so much more um, potential to, you know, raise the profile of the game, I think. Mm.
Anyway, we'll keep harping on about yes, it. Yes, I Hopefully suppose so. We'll, we'll be back. We'll change. be here another twenty years talking about the same things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, now, speaking of polls, last week we had the poll um, regarding which coach uh, this season will be under the most pressure. Now we've had some results come in from that. I think you and I discussed potentially Rowan Smith being uh, the most under pressure coach. Uh, but the fans have voted. The guy who's won the poll is Sam Burgess, yep. you know, which which isn't surprising, really, because obviously it's his first major job, and his, his, his job is to um, boost the uh, Wolves from what they've been in the last couple of years. Yep. Totally inconsistent. And his job is, I suppose, to instill a, a, a tougher mentality. Mm into the club yeah. and um, there's a lot on the line for Sam because obviously if he doesn't succeed um, his coaching career as a first grade coach may be over before it starts but mm. he's, he's an incredibly determined guy and I certainly hope that he um, has what it takes to make a great success. I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see Warrington reaching a grand final for example and, and even winning it because we do need, we always I mean, it's the old joke, isn't it? This could be Warrington's year. It's mm. been said for the last goodness knows how many years. Um, but we'd love to see it happen one day. One, mm. one day, surely, it's got to be there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> tell you what, that first, or not first, but that matchup against Penrith might give us a good insight as to where they're at. Um, I think that might be a behind closed doors <laughs> encounter, mm. but it's even so, well, we might be able to <laughs> blag our way in, who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never know. Set up some or, secret or send a drone, cameras. send a drone over the field. <laughs> but uh, the, the guy who came second, by the way, was Rowan Smith um, with 28.5% of the vote. Mm. Sam got 30 32.22%. And then the other coaches were, um, you know, quite a way behind. Ian Watson, Tony Smith, Craig Lingard, Daryl Powell. So, um, you know, it's certainly... But but the thing, the thing about being under pressure, Jake, is that it changes depending on results. If Warrington win their first four or five games of the season uh, without a defeat, Sam Burgess certainly won't be the coach mm-hmm. under the most pressure. The guy who will be under the most pressure is the one who does suffer defeat. Interestingly, we didn't include um, Mike Eccles in in the poll last week, the the London Broncos coach, Mm -hmm. because no matter what he does, they're going to get relegated at the end of the year. I mean, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? So. You know, in in a way, it takes the pressure off him. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of London Broncos, that's almost reflected in um, the, their recruitment for next season. They've let a few players go, but they yes. haven't really brought any big names uh, into no. that squad as no. of yet. So it seems like they've almost. You the know, biggest one is probably Reese Kennedy, isn't it? Who they've signed mm, from Hull KR. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it looks as though. I mean, what would you invest if you're going to get relegated? You know. What and I mean? the thing it's, is. What gets me is um, their opening game of the season is away at St. Helens. I mean, they couldn't really have been given a tougher one, could they? It's almost as though they're being told, you know, you're not really welcome here. It's just ridiculous, in my view. Uh, It really is. And especially uh, the narrative around how important it is for Super League to have a team based in London. Absolutely. It just baffles me. Um, but it does me. I just can't understand it. Uh, anyway, as, as we said, we'll harp there on many, about There it. are many things in rugby league, though, Jake, that I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, you and I both. Yeah. Um, now, oh, there was a bit of news today um, surrounding Tristan Saylor. So it's come out that the Broncos rejected uh, the Lee Leopards' request to uh, release Tristan Saylor from his contract. And the Broncos cited that he was too important um, to their squad mm. and he's contracted until the end of 2025 so um, just a little bit of yeah a backstory there as to what happened a few weeks ago with that yeah well I'm not too story. surprised about that because I really rate him very highly as well you know from what I've seen of him and, and that's not a great deal I've got to say but he looks a, a really great player and he's certainly got the DNA hasn't he from his yeah. father uh, Wendell so I'm not surprised the Broncos don't want to release him because um, they've lost one or two backs haven't they of course yeah. Herbie Farmworth of course is is the major one um to the leopards and um, not to the to the leopards the dolphins mm. um and um so that you know they, they don't want to lose too many players I don't think and um the, the Broncos uh, I think this year are quite confident that they can go one step further than last mm. year and, and win the competition so that's going to be fascinating to see yeah absolutely and 
you know, he was crucial through the State of Origin period last year for the Broncos, and I'm sure he'll be crucial again this mm. year. He can fill in a lot of positions, so I'm sure by the end of 2025, his value would have increased, yes. and um, I'm sure there'll be a heap of Super League clubs with interest in Absolutely. signing him. Um, now, just some League One news. It's been reported this week that uh, Hunslet uh, recorded a £45,000 uh, loss uh, at the year ending November 2023, which is a bit of a surprise. I'm not sure where. <coughs> yes, that I'm not sure how they. I've, I've, I've not seen the um, financial figures in detail, but I'm surprised that they've lost that much. Yeah. And of course, ultimately, they can't go on losing money in, in, in that way. Um, maybe they need somebody to come in and shore them up. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously. In, in, in rugby league, it's a good thing if you've got a very wealthy individual who can, um, you know, guarantee the, a, a club's losses and so on, and 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 put money into a club. And and Hunslet perhaps need one as much as most many other clubs do. And uh, we've we've seen what happens when you get a, a major financial backer, as we've seen at Wakefield, yep. um, who have struggled along for many years and. Uh, but now on the back of um, Matthew Ellis coming in and buying the club out, they've sold probably 5,500 season tickets mm. for 2024, which is, which is significantly higher than their average crowd was in 2023. Okay. So they've sold more season tickets than they had a crowd last year. And, and that just shows what happens when, when people have confidence that a club is going to go in the right direction. Mm. And that's why I'd, I'd, I'd love to see... Uh, you know, the the club that I would really love to see having a, a wealthy backer is Salford. Um, you know, in the heart of Greater Manchester, um, right beneath that M60, M, M, whatever it is now, it's M60, isn't it? The the motorway that goes across the bridge and looks down on the, um, on, on the stadium, the Salford Community Stadium. They need a major financial backer more than anyone. But if they had one... I think they could make such enormous progress, and it's just waiting. I mean, it's it's frustrating for me. We've just seen Jim Ratcliffe buy a major stake in Manchester United. Jim Ratcliffe, the wealthiest man in Britain. Yeah. He grew up, started life in a council house in Oldham, and then also lived in Hull, yeah. uh, two rugby league towns or cities. Uh, and yet he's, he's a football man, not a rugby league man, which is, uh, you know, a source of great regret for me. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, if he bought Salford instead of Manchester United, A, he could have bought the whole of Salford mm. for a fraction of what it cost him to buy Manchester United, a, a stake in Manchester United. And I think he could probably guarantee more success uh, at Salford than than he would have uh, he, he will do at Manchester United, but you know what do I know? But um, so if only I were as rich as him, I'd yeah. uh, I'd, I'd step in and, and buy Salford. But that's a long way off, I'm afraid. We'll have to pressure him, tell him not to put all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely, mate. Come and yeah. Spread out the love. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah quite disappointing for Hunslet because they obviously fell short of promotion. I think they got knocked out in the semi final. Uh, last season, so yes. they're competing in League One like they were there or thereabouts uh, for promotion. Um, well, I'm a, so. you know, I, I I was one of those people who felt that they should have combined the championship and League One in 2024, mm-hmm. and I put forward a, a scheme to the Rugby Football League that would uh, you know have facilitated that. Uh, but they didn't adopt it. They might do conceivably for 2025, but I'm not quite sure what their intentions are. Um, but, you know, I think a nine-team league is, is pretty difficult, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But, um, but it's, it's actually, it's also, it's got the potential to be quite exciting as well. I mean, Oldham have invested a lot. Mm. Uh, Oldham's an interesting case this year. I think they will run away with League One this year because they've, you know, got some new backers. They've got Mike Ford uh, in charge of them. They're playing at um, Oldham FC's Boundary Park. Um, stadium, which is a, a, gr- a great stadium, uh, perfect for rugby league, in fact. And I think they'll draw a lot of a n- new support this year. And Oldham is an absolutely great rugby league town. It's it's produced so many great players over the years. Obviously, Kevin Sinfield is one that that's Paul Sculthorpe is is another, and there are lots and lots more. Um, and th- they fell on hard times. Um, there were a, a 
massive club in the 1950s and even in the 1960s, but they gradually declined and they were one of those clubs. When we moved to two divisions in 1973, they were one of those clubs that fell on the wrong side of the divide and always then struggled to get back up to where they used to be. And it's, it's time for them to... You know, it's it's time for them to be a Phoenix club, in my view, and to, you know, recover some of that former status. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Now, Martin, you also touched on in your uh, column this week, uh, you had a few suggestions around overseas player quota. Um, do you be able to sort of touch on that a little bit for the for the podcast? What well, your it's one of was? one of my bugbears is that we we have so many overseas players in 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 our game. I've got nothing against any overseas player. Um, it's just that. By having so many in our game, we very often block the development of some of our own younger players. And and this is where... And, you know, some of our clubs, they they find it easier to go to Australia and find a player playing, uh, you know, in the Queensland Cup or New South Wales Cup. We, we can now sign players, of course, 24 or under, mm-hmm. um, who who haven't even played in the NRL yet. And some of our clubs find it easier to do that than to scout and find players in our own country. And I think that's a terrible uh, a terrible thing. Uh, it costs them a fortune as well. And with clubs' income declining, I think it's about time we started looking at the overseas player quota and planning to bring it down. Basically, what I've suggested is it, it's seven players at the moment on the quota i've suggested bringing it down by one every two years so it's seven for 2024 make it six for 2026 Mm. five for 2028 and i would get down to two personally Mm. i think two would be the right number so that you'd still you know be able to sign australian players and new zealand players um but you wouldn't be absolutely um having so many that you did deter some of our own younger players. What you find is that some of our younger players, they only get a chance in Super League if an overseas player who's blocking his place gets injured and therefore gives an opportunity. Mm. And and that's regrettable in my view and um, something we, you know, we ought to look at. I also think there should be a separate salary cap for overseas players as well mm. as part of the wider salary cap. So, you know, but again, my uh, thoughts have not been taken up by the RFL as, as yet. But you never know, there might mm. be mm. one day. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I guess that'll raise the standard of uh, those players that are coming over. Um, and yeah, as you said, uh, will definitely improve yeah. the uh, rookies. I mean, on over. the other hand, it's, it's always great to see overseas players come over here. And sometimes you find that the ones who are expected to be star players don't shine. Mm. But one or two guys, I mean, the best example... Um, of, of a guy who nobody would really heard of, knew anything about, but really shone very brightly, is Edwin Apapi, the uh, mm. Lee player, mm. who was our Albert Goldthorpe Rookie of the Year this year, and th- or last year. And that, that was interesting, because prior to 2023, Edwin Apapi, obviously, was part of Lee's championship, um, championship uh, side that won the championship in 2022, mm. but he'd never played in the NRL or Super League before 2023, which makes him qualify as a rookie. Mm. You know, and it's quite amazing, even though he played for Papua New Guinea. Um, So uh, so you do get players like that sometimes who who come across and show how good they are. And, you know, I think Edwin Apap is a really great player. Oh, yeah. Well, he's, you know, one of the best uh, dummy half hookers in the competition at the moment. No doubt about it. um, Yeah, I'm sure uh, Lee were... You know, licking their lips when they uh, uh, unleashed his potential. And yes, well, they spotted him. Of. They spotted him before anybody else did, mm, didn't they? No, that's right. And uh, I remember hearing stories of um, him not even making the Papua New Guinea Hunters yes. uh, side. Well, I think he had uh, a bit of a career. dispute with them, didn't he? That something mm. didn't work out there. But you know, their losses lose gain. Mm, absolutely right. Now, uh, in other news, I thought this is a pretty funny story. But um, yeah, Hull are taking extra steps to ensure sa- uh, safety ahead of their round one derby against uh, the Rovers. Uh, Can can you see this one getting out of hand in the stands, Martin? Well, apparently it did a bit last year. Um, And, uh, you know, there's always the chance that um, one or two hot-headed people are going to start fighting, um, 
you know when particularly when they're a bit disappointed with their own team's performance but mm. in my view the um, the best way to avoid that is to have a game that goes right down to the wire so that nobody's really got time to um, you know, yell abuse at the uh, opposing fans and pick fights with them and so on. Yeah. Uh, but we can't guarantee that, of course. That's right. um, I'm looking forward to that game, um, Jake. I really am. And uh, I hope it's a sellout at, uh, at, at, at the MKM Stadium too. It certainly deserves to be. And I really hope that Hull FC play well and um you know take it you know i'd, I'd love to see a game settled in golden point time mm. whichever whole club wins i mean i'm equally uh, uh, you know i like both clubs and uh, i'm equally admiring of both clubs both coaches and both sets of players so i don't care who wins but i just hope it's a great game no absolutely we all, uh, all want to see a great contest there a hard-fought battle and yeah, I mean, it's it's coming up on us quick, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just say one other thing as well about um, the opening week of the season. You'll have seen now that um, we get, we, we're we going to have some new um, commentators on Sky mm. uh, with Dave Woods from the BBC coming in and um, um, Kyla Moore is, uh, is, is, is coming in too. Uh, you know, so we're going to have... Um, you know, new faces. But the crazy thing is that the opening week of the season, we're going to have three games on Friday night, all kicking off at the same time. All three of those games are going to be shown in on, on, on Sky channels. Um, I think, did I mention it um, in my column this week? Um, yeah, Sky, Sky is delivering, but the clubs get in the way. So... It'll, so Sky will broadcast the Leeds versus Salford game on main event and arena, while at the same time it will s screen Lee versus Huddersfield on Sky Sports Mix and St Helens versus London Broncos on Sky Sports Action. Now, that's crazy because you're going to dilute the audience mm. for all three games. You know, obviously... The fans of Huddersfield and Lee will watch their game. The fans of Saints and London will watch their game. So the, you know, if if the only game on at that time were Leeds v Salford, those fans would be watching Leeds v Salford. So the 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 audience will be suppressed effectively mm -hmm. uh, for each game. Now in Australia, you've got eight games every weekend, but they're all played at, uni at unique kickoff times aren't mm. they so there's never there are never two games or three games on at the same time why we have to have this um is beyond me it really is surely we could have got a situation where we had one game on thursday one game on friday perhaps three games on saturday mm. and maybe one or two games on sunday uh. <coughs> all played at different times so that we're not um having that impact of squashing the audience, mm. which, bearing in mind, we're looking for a, you know, we've got a short-term contract here with Sky. We need audiences to be as big as they can possibly be to persuade Sky to pay us more next time. I just find this utterly mm. stupid, really. Yeah, and it's like um, there's only, what, six games as compared yes. to the NRL's eight, um, and it's like, you know, if, the, if you can't find a way to stagger those games... It's just crazy. There's something going on there. You it's know just I mean? absolutely it's... ridiculous. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, those, you know, those six games, there are lots of rugby league fans who would love nothing more um, with Sky subscriptions to be able to watch all six games live, mm. as you can in Australia if you're a Fox Sports subscriber. Yep. But they can't do that now. Yeah. They can only watch four games live mm. and then watch two games on catch-up, yeah. which is, you know, it takes away the the uh, the enjoyment, doesn't it? And is this would this um, be partly the club's fault as well for wanting to play those Friday night games, or do they not oh, get I've, any I've say? No doubt, no doubt, it's the club's fault. Yeah. The clubs have far too much influence in being able to block sensible ideas. Mm. The, the The problem is that our game, the, the sport over here, it, it, the health of Super League is not the main thing. For the, the clubs, put themselves first 
and then Super League second. Yeah. And it's not surprising because they've got the if if you've got the power to do that, then you will exercise that power, won't you? Mm. And it, it's just absolutely ridiculous. So mm. I just I just despair sometimes. That's it. And in my view, there's nothing better than Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon football. Nothing. You no, know, you're absolutely I'll take right. Any kickoff time between you know one p.m. and four p.m. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, a perfect way to sort of uh, you know spend your Saturday Sunday afternoon. So, absolutely. Um, whereas you know. Friday 6 p.m. or Friday 8 p.m. It's you know after a work day, people have got to travel to the games and obviously. well, 6 p.m. is a bad time to kick off, isn't it? Mm. Because people haven't got time to get there. But 8 p.m. is not so bad. But mm. you could easily have. I mean, the NRL has three games on Saturday, doesn't it? And yeah. I think their kickoff is at one one o'clock, four o'clock, and seven o'clock, or or something like that. Mm. And it would be easy for us to do that here, mm. but we aren't doing, and it's just nuts you know it really is nuts mm. oh another thing we can continue to harp on Ab- about <laughs> absolutely <laughs> endless list of things we'd like to see uh changed but um anything else you want to touch on before we uh well i think off? we've touched on quite a bit there uh, jake and yeah. uh, we've we've maybe said quite a few things that um might upset some people at the hour <laughs> hell who knows <laughs> if they take right. any notice of us at all which i hope they do but yeah. you know you never know oh if we no. are ruffling feathers we aren't doing our job no, exactly. No, there's 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 a lot to talk about, and um, oh, you know, just just one thing. Actually, one thing I was going to mention: mm-hmm. uh, the Challenge Cup kicked off at the weekend, first round of the Challenge Cup. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> there were some really um, great games, and um, shout out to um, Tara Jones, the St Helens um, women's player, who scored the first try in the Challenge Cup final at Wembley last year the first ever women's challenge cup final to be played at wembley yeah. she refereed the um raf versus navy game oh, in the challenge cup which and and did have actually watched that game and she did a a really great job and um the navy triumphed in the end uh, i think it was um 20 28 points to 22 which was great you know great to see great game and um and also, um, the British Army lost 13-10 to Fryston. That was a very good performance by Fryston as well. And But the uh, acclaim, I suppose, ought to go to um, the London-based club West's Warriors, who I think play out of Ealing. Mm-hmm. Um, they beat the Huddersfield club New St Panthers 28 points to four. They played that game at Wasps. Um, rugby union club so you know great great for them and um the the second round won't be played this weekend but it will be played the following weekend and um if we look at the um look at the draw um the royal navy will host thato heath crusaders and west's warriors will host rochdale mayfield which is a very Tough game for, for, for them against Rochdale May for a very good amateur side. And Hammersmith Hills Hoists, they're another London-based club, and they've also got a home game against West Bowling. So if you're in London at uh, that weekend, um, you'll get the chance to see some Challenge Cup football. And uh, Or if you're in, I think, the Royal Navy play at Portsmouth. Yep. So if you're down there, anybody watching who, who lives in that part of the world, get along to uh, to to watch a, a challenge cup game and uh, mm. they they you know the royal navy as i say play thato heath the the, the very strong st helens amateur side so okay. you know i always think the season starts with the you know when the challenge cup gets going yep. so it's it's really great to see it isn't it no absolutely and uh, all pretty close uh, score lines there as well so it seems like it's competitive football uh, being played, which is always great to see. You never want to see big blowout games. No, so, no, not at all. Um, yeah, really exciting that the um, Challenge Cup's sort of getting underway. And don't forget, if you do want uh, all the news uh, surrounding those Challenge Cup results, uh, head along to totalrl.com forward slash shop uh, to su- secure your online subscription to uh, the League Express weekly newspaper. And, um, yeah, Martin, well, if you're happy, mate, we might wrap it up yeah, here. Yeah, that's it this week, by the it's way, just to, to show the front cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matty Pete on the front cover with, um, um, you know, as I say, a centre spread interview with him about Wigan's prospects for the year. So, mm. lot to read. It's, um, you know, and it's lovely and sunny outside, but absolutely freezing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I can't wait to put my jacket back on no, and my gloves no. when I do head back outside. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, big month ahead or big month next month for, for Matty Pete. So, yeah. I'm sure he'll be uh, getting the boys ready for that World Club Challenge. But I'm sure he will. 
Uh, all right, mate, we might end it here. Thanks again, guys, for um, tuning in, and we'll do it all again next week. It's a pleasure, Jack. Good to see you again. Thanks awesome. a lot. Thanks, mate. Cheers.